Good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we're here with another of our virtual events this evening. And tonight, Brian Klingborg joins us. We're going to be discussing his new book, Thief of Souls, which is just a beautiful cover. They did a really nice job with the, the design of the book. Um, welcome, Brian. It's good to see you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, for those of you watching on uh, Facebook, I will be monitoring the comments field. So if you have questions for Brian, uh, go ahead and put them in the comments and I will reemerge towards the end of the hour uh, to ask some of your questions. And I may have a few of my own too. So Just over like to you, Barbara. Just like a Chinese dragon or a Chinese gin or whatever it might be. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll talk about Judge D maybe or some of those things. We yeah. could talk about Judge D. Do you have any incense? It would be sort of fun, Brian, if you know you were able to light and wave some incense. Uh, and we, you know, I have an incense was a burner, incense. but I'm fresh out of incense. <laughs> Too bad. All righty. I am holding this book up because it is our international crime book for May. Um, and it's always a pleasure to introduce readers, not just to new authors, but places they might not have gone. Love the cover. But where we are in China is a place that I have perhaps been on the edge of, but never actually gone. And I'm pretty sure I can't pronounce it, Brian. So why don't you tell us the name of the province and where it's located? Uh, it's called Heilongjiang. And it's, uh, it means basically uh, Black Dragon River. So it is a river that bisects Northern China from Russian territory. And uh, old place, um, you know, interesting uh, combination of Russian, Korean and uh, Chinese culture uh, going way back, but uh, a little bit remote and, um, isolated and a very cold weather. So, you know, a foreboding place in some ways. Well, I, yeah, China does have extremely cold weather up in the North. And I'm, I'm thinking we did a wonderful event for a nonfiction author whose specialty was the um, owls of Eastern Siberia. And hmm. I think he was somewhere near the border because we talked about that, um, the border between China and Russia. He was on the Russian side, but hmm. not terribly far. Does the Trans-Siberian Railroad touch any of this on its way to Vladivostok? It does, doesn't it? Yes, uh, excellent question. Actually, the city, you know, the book is set in a small town called Raven Valley, that's the English name. Um, this, the nearest big city is called Harbin, uh, which is also known as City of Ice because it's so cold during the winter. They have a big ice schedule, a uh, sculpture there, a festival and so on. But uh, that was the terminus uh, of the Trans-Siberian Railroad or a depot there that the Russians built in the late 1800s. So that's kind of how that city really became a metropolis. Before that, it was a much more smaller backwater town. You know, I always wanted to do the trains. I've done lots of interesting railroad trips and I always wanted to do that one. And then YouTube offered some videos for people who had actually taken the Trans-Siberian Railroad fairly recently. Mm -hmm. And after I watched it, I concluded that it wasn't going to be the railroad journey of my dreams, right, uh, right. in part because, you know, the, the vision of old Russia, I was a Russian major, it's, well, not a minor at Stanford, and I had a wonderful professor, Ivan Ivanovich Stenbach Firmer, who on weekends taught profanity at the Army Language School of Monterey to potential spies, but that's back in like 1960. <laughs> but I, I loved him. But um, I always had this wonderful vision of, you know, these kind of old Russian cities and the Trans-Siberian Railroad to go mm -hmm. through them. And now you look at it and, you know, it looks like Shanghai, the island. I mean, it's all high rises and steel mm -hmm. and glass and you know, modern Germany or something, and, and all the romance of it is gone. Yeah, the uh, the Chinese have a very strong train game. Their trains are very high tech for the most part. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of the old romanticism is probably gone. But on the other hand, they're probably a lot more comfortable and a lot faster. So it kind of depends. Absolutely. On yeah, no, that's true. I mean, we were in, um, when I was in China, we also went to Macau while it was still mm -hmm. Portuguese. I think it was 1997. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was almost no new building. And in fact, there was a beautiful Portuguese temple on, a, on an island. 
that, mm -hmm. I mean, at the southern part of the island, you know, to, to the fisher, I think she was a fisher god or something. Mods it. Mods it was, it. Yeah, it was gorgeous. And, and there was a wonderful old Portuguese restaurant where I got introduced to Vino mm -hmm. Verde, which has subsequently become a passion for me. <laughs> By the way, I'm in, I'm raising a glass to you. And oh, honor thank you. Thief of Souls, you're right. Um, and I'm, I'm going to join you with my good. Texas beer. These are BYOB events we concluded not long ago, but uh, oh, good, more. Anyway, the, uh, um, I share this room with the cat, and the cat just decided to leave, so I had to shut the door. But yeah, but but I have now seen I have now seen pictures of Macau, and in twenty two years, twenty three years, I can't even recognize it. Mm -hmm. And and the same is true of Shanghai when we were there. You could still walk down the Bund. I mean, it wasn't fabulous, but it was still there. And that island was almost completely empty. And now, mm -hmm. of course, it looks like Manhattan. So the Chinese have made some extraordinary, mm -hmm. accelerated, I mean, accelerated extraordinarily yeah. in just over two decades. So you are a student, um, as I remember, of Asian studies and maybe Chinese cultural anthropology. How does this strike you? When was the last time you were in China? I was in China about three years ago, uh, went with my family. But the first time I went to China was when I was doing a junior year abroad in Taiwan. That was 1987. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and I uh, took a three week trip through China and we went by train. So we she actually grew up in Hong Kong. So we went into Hong Kong and then we took the train to Guangzhou. And from there, we traveled around for three weeks and uh, talk about rustic trains. Those were rustic trains back in those days. They had, as I recall, three levels, the soft sleeper, the hard sleeper, and just the heart. You know, the heart was just a seat. So we took the soft sleeper, which by no means was luxurious. But it was definitely a cultural experience. We would get off in the, in the big cities, walk around for a few days. Um, and then that time when we went to Shanghai, there had been no new construction. I, I don't know if this this for a fact, but there, there didn't appear to have been any new construction, certainly since the communist takeover in 1949. There were a lot of beautiful old buildings there that were built by foreign concessions in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Magnificent buildings um, that were empty or derelict. I can remember going into what may have been a department store in the 1920s or 30s, and it was just this huge, spacious place. And there, you know, there was a guy there with a mat on the floor selling cotton shoes. Uh, there was just no, there were no products, there was no retail, and. Uh, you know, people talk about the iron rice bowl. So back in those days, uh, the social system was such that your work and all aspects of your life were dictated by your local work group. And um, you didn't get more money for working harder. You didn't get tips and uh, promotions and things like that, depending on your production. So people just kind of coasted to some extent. There was no incentive for them to work harder. You would go into a restaurant and you would sit quietly, I remember distinctly sitting quietly until somebody brought us a menu because if you asked for the menu and upset them, they'd be like, forget this guy and they wouldn't bring you the menu. So, you know, it was a very different place, uh, hard to get around. There wasn't a lot of food. I mean, there was the, the food wasn't of great quality. There were no foreign goods to speak of. Um, but very interesting experience. And uh, that was 87. The last, the next time I went to Shanghai was probably, I want to say 96 or 97. And, it, you know, it would completely transform. There were skyscrapers and so on. I haven't been there since then, but I have been to Beijing. Um, and Beijing has changed a lot. The first time I went to Beijing in 87, they had these huge concrete highways, but no cars. Now, the traffic is abysmal, you know, and everybody's got luxury cars um, and you just can't get anywhere, even in the city, you know, in the space of less than an hour and a half. So as with any developing country, there are a lot of pros and a lot of minuses. A lot of people have benefited and a lot of people have been left behind. And it's become a real 
issue, the income disparity and social inequality has become a real issue in China. Well, of course it has. And not only that, the environmental stuff, I mean, it reminds me of, you know, the London fog in the 1950s that were so the great smoke and so forth. I mean, we were in Beijing, you could barely breathe. Mm -hmm. And not only is that, you know, um, automobile and other pollution, but the, the dust sweeping in from the West right. is a huge problem um, in Northern China and can make it um, a nightmare. Um, I, I am a huge fan of the Chinese novels by Qiu Shilong, who I, is a, has become a friend. And I think Death of a Red Heroine did a brilliant job depicting the Shanghai that you are talking about, where you know there were neighborhood wardens and mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. Tom Bradby wrote a really brilliant book, and I'm, Patrick, you can look it up on your phone. I think it was called something like Twenty Days of Rain or Rain or something. But anyway, set in the 1920s in the in the Bund part of Shanghai when it was still actually operating um, with European concessions and. You know, there's a there's a lot of well, well, we can talk about Judge D and other great stuff as we move along. But yours is is a book that is set um, in a place that we're not familiar with, and um, in contemporary China. So, um, is it Lu Fei or Lu Fai? How do you pronounce it? Fei, hey, yeah, Lu Fei. Lu Fei. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and is that the Chinese thing where Lu is the family name and Fei mm -hmm. is the is his Christian name? Okay. Exactly. Or sorry, not Christian, but you know. I know what you mean. <laughs> Give a yeah. name. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, um, which is like Q Shalong. I mean, his real his real name is Shalong, right? Okay, mm -hmm. Tom Bradby, Master of Rain. Thank you. I love the chat feature. Patrick is always able to save me when I have these. <laughs> um, if if you've never read Master of Rain, I can highly recommend it to you because it it really does take you back into that wonderful period in China. We were in Hong Kong. Um, again, they had the, the clock was actually down by the water and it was counting down the days until, mm -hmm. right. until the British left. So mm -hmm. never, yeah. yeah. So never saw the romantic haze of British Empire over Hong Kong, saw mm -hmm. it when it was actually just in limbo and barely yeah. functioning. So it was mm -hmm. an interesting transition. Um, closest I ever got to where you are was really the section of the Great Wall that is near Beijing, which mm -hmm. is fairly far north. How far is it from um, from Harbin? Uh, I, I don't know in terms of miles or kilometers, but quite far, quite far. Oh, it is, yeah. okay. Yeah. So why did you elect um, to set your book in a province that is so um, unfamiliar? Um, well, because, uh, Generally speaking, if you're going to read a book set in China, it's in Shanghai or Beijing. Just like, you know, if you're going to read a book set in France, it's often in Paris or New York or Los Angeles in the US. So I wanted to do something different. And I'll be, you know, this is perfectly honest and perhaps secret. I've never been to Harbin. I don't know Harbin very well. So I needed to choose something that I could research, but also remake to some extent the way I needed it to be remade. Now, when I write the book, when, I, when I've written these books or any book that I've written, I've been very careful about researching actual places, uh, including road names, structures, buildings, and so on and so forth. So most things that appear in Stephen Souls are, are real settings, real places, or you know some amalgamation of something that I've found. But I did need some flexibility to write a story set in a Chinese city that I didn't necessarily need to have walked down the street and said, this, this is on that corner and this is on this corner. Um, but I also wanted, as part of my protagonist's backstory, for him to have been a, an up and coming police officer, somebody who was on the rise, who was doing great things, but then essentially got relegated to a more backwater town um, because of corruption or whatever. And that's, so that's part of his backstory. Uh, and Harbin kind of fit the bill of being close to, you know, being a, a large major city, but also having a place that he could um, perhaps be relegated to that would still provide some interesting backstory. Um, also, Harbin is just a really interesting place, you know, from what I understand. As I mentioned, 
it really grew when the Russians were there creating the terminus for the railway. It had a very large traditional Jewish population. Um, so it had a real international concession in the late 1800s, unlike a lot of other cities in China. Um, also, you know, when was rested back and forth between the Japanese and the Chinese and so on. So there's a lot of inf interesting information there, interesting historical background that I hope to dig into later on in later books. Well, yeah, um, because we don't really spend that much time in Harbin in this book. We're, we're mm -hmm. um, in, so what is the name of the backwater to which Lu Fei has been assigned? And did you make that up? Is that an entirely fictitious village? Yeah, it's entirely fictitious. It, there is a real location, more or less, but um, I, ca I call it Raven Valley and uh, just, you know, used, uh, I wanted, uh, I, I wanted something that had the connotation of I originally had a name which was Wu Shi, which had uh, some connotation, some negative connotation related to Chinese bird mythology, but it was too complicated and I thought it might be too difficult to pronounce. So I just changed it to Raven Valley, keeping the, the Raven part of it. And, uh, um, you know, uh, I did a lot of research on the topography of the area, finding what flowers and flora were there. And there are some beautiful valleys. It is kind of a river valley. So that just kind of came together as a last minute um, idea. I was um, noticing that your English publisher is calling this book City of Ice, not mm -hmm. Angel of Souls. Um, why do you think why do you think they're, they're these two titles? I mean, because publishers, for those of you who don't know this, generally get to decide titles. Authors mm -hmm. can be consulted, but really it's up to marketing and sales and publishing houses to a great degree about what to call a book. So what do you think it says Thief of Souls for an American audience and City of Ice for a UK and continental office audience? Well, my, my title was Thief of Souls. Uh, I, I'm sorry, my title was City of Ice because it relates to uh, the nickname of Harvey. Okay. Um, but I think uh, Minotaur thought that there were several books out there with that title, that it maybe wasn't evocative enough of the Chinese setting. So we went back and forth and actually my editor finally came up with Thief of Souls and uh, we went with it because there is a, you know, not to, not to uh, spoil anything, but there is an aspect to the book which has to do with uh, the soul and what, you know, the, the motive of the killer, basically. All right, well, I think it's a good title. And I, we've already all said that we think the cover is very dramatic. I was just curious as to which one, you know, was yours, if either, because it's right. possible that you didn't actually title either book. So um, in the village, what's it called? Raven Valley. Raven Valley. Um, yeah. Right. Um, you made up, I presume, you created the bar in which Lu Fei seems to spend more time than he should. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he, he is a drinker. Um, mm. And and I think I think that's true in a lot of Chinese culture. I sort of, you know, you, you do imagine um, many of them really pound it down. Um, mm. And maybe in a northern cold place. See, I have a theory that there are reasons why people in Ireland and Scotland and Russia possibly Iceland and all drink a lot mm -hmm. um, because, you know, you have to find some way to get through all the cold and the dark. And mm -hmm. um, and so I'm wondering if that wouldn't be true in Southern or Western China. I mean, if you if you know Elsa Hart's books or wonderful 18th century books mm -hmm. about China, mm -hmm. which I think are absolutely brilliant, although the last one is in fact in Beijing mm -hmm. um, in still in the 18th century. I don't know if the drinking culture is as predominant all over China or whether it tends to um, fasten itself upon some of the more extreme climates. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts? Yeah, uh, I think if you look back at Chinese literature and poetry, especially, a lot of the poets were big drinkers and they would get together on a beautiful moonlit night and sit outside where they could appreciate nature and drink wine and compose poems. You know, as entertainment, and um, uh, I, there's an aspect of Taoist, 
kind of Taoist exploration, mental exploration, freedom, freeing yourself from your body in different ways. Um, they didn't have drugs per se, but they certainly experimented with different kinds of elixirs. But drinking, you know, was something that uh, has become part of Chinese culture, most most generally in a joyful way, a happy way where you're being convivial, talking to your friends, and you're kind of expanding your mind. So you're you're extolling the, the virtues of nature, you're creating poetry, you're playing games and having a good time. It's a joyful thing for the most part, I believe, in Chinese culture. But not so, for Wu Fei, as it all turns out, because he's actually not a particularly happy person. Uh, yeah, I guess you could say he's a little emotionally uh, shut down, um, but I don't think that's definitely unusual for anybody who lives in a society where they aren't free to explore their dreams perhaps in the way that they want to, or there isn't a lot of social mobility. Um, he's definitely a lonely person in some ways, and he's, you know, China's got an interesting situation with um, gender disparity. So uh, because for many years there was a one child policy and uh, because in Chinese culture, the family line is carried down through the father's side um, the, and through male children, male children are valued and there are fewer females out there now than there might have been otherwise. So finding a suitable mate is getting really difficult. There's lots of different dating sites and different things that are setting people up. But for a guy like Lou Fei, who wants to marry for love rather than just make a match that's uh, a good family match that will provide children and so on and so forth, you know, it might be harder for him to meet somebody. He doesn't feel like jumping on a, on a dating site or something like that. So yeah, he spends his time drinking and kind of pining for Yen Yen, who is the owner of this bar from afar. Um, you know, and, and their relationship will develop as the story continues. I don't think his drinking is unjoyful or um, it, it's excessive, sure, but it's, you know, he's not a mean drunk or anything like that. And he does say a couple of times about he, how he is seeking inspiration through inebriation. So I don't know if that's a good message or not, but every now and then, if you have a couple of, of drinks, you might, something might occur to you that otherwise wouldn't when you're allowed to unfetter the mind. So that's basically what's going on with him. Well, I certainly didn't mean to imply that he was a mean drunk or <laughs> that he was necessarily drunk. I mean, he drinks a lot, but I don't know, you know, lots of people, I am not one of them. Um, I'm a one glass of wine person and then it's all mm. over for me, but um, there are people who can drink amazing amounts and still say relatively sober. So, you know, I can, I can see what would he do on long cold nights right. in the village. You know, it's, it's interesting that the analogy between the Chinese male today after the one child policy where girl children were sadly often killed or, you know, given away or other bad things. Um, very much like what happened um, to English women after World War I when so many men were killed and many of them became, you know, were, were spinsters for life because mm -hmm. it was impossible for them to, uh, with a small pool of men available, mm -hmm. uh, to find mates. So, you know, timing is so much of life, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Where you find yourself in what situation mm -hmm. can determine many things about your life in which you had no say whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it's fate. Well, probably is. Yeah. Um, you know, what, what can I say? But anyway, okay, so here he is in the valley and he's, um, he has a superior officer mm -hmm. with whom he has considerable tension and not a lot of mutual respect a lot of the time. So that always seems to be a function of, not always, but in many police procedurals to introduce tension and conflict we do have that kind of dynamic going on, either with a you know fellow officer or with a superior officer or something, mm -hmm. but you wind up with dynamics within the actual police department mm -hmm. as separate from whatever's going on in the investigation and they're chasing after um, bad guys and justice. So you set that up, I'm assuming, for those reasons? Are you referring, well, he's got a direct superior, Chief Liang, who he has a, 
a pretty good relationship would be because Chief Liang is kind of a lazy ne'er-do-well who right. recognizes that Lu Fei is a smart guy and can take care of things while he's out doing karaoke. But then when the murder occurs, the you know Criminal Investigations Bureau from Beijing is called in and that guy, Mr. Song, yeah. Deputy Director Song is the guy that is really kind of hard to work with. Um, and yes, uh, you know, Song is uh, a, a, a politician essentially. And um, as you, as I'm sure you know, if you look at what's going on in Chinese politics, all of these ministries and all of these um, people who are rising in power, they're kind of subject to different kinds of vagaries of fate and the relationships that they know, and they have to tread very carefully. So Sung's a guy who's, who's very ambitious and he knows where he wants to get. And in order to get there, he's willing to cut corners or to push, you know, sweep things under the rug or whatever. Not, not to an ex a really bad extent, but certainly, yeah, his ambition drives him. So he and Lu Fei have some tension in the fact that Lu Fei doesn't believe the initial suspect is the killer. And Song is more interested in closing the case than really, and, and then getting out of Harbin because, you know, in his job, he travels all around the country constantly investigating cases. So yeah, that, there is some tension there, but I think they come to an understanding, a, a mutual respect. And uh, Song will appear in later books in a similar fashion where he's both helpful and harmful at the same time. Well, Song is not a red prince, um, in which case he wouldn't have to do a whole lot, um, but right. he's definitely ambitious. And, you know, I, I find that interesting, that whole dynamic with red princes, people connected to, um, you know, to the higher echelons of the party, not really so much the higher echelons of government, but really the higher echelons of the Communist Party, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's changed slightly in the time since, well, a lot since Mao started it, but um, in the last, what, couple of decades that right now it's in a, an iron grip. Um, it was a little bit looser earlier, and it's difficult to know how it will go forward and how much the forces of capitalism will create change. And, you know, so many things are going on in China. Yeah. Um, so far, no, no purely communist society has ever really flourished. And, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so it'll be uh, some sort of blend of capitalism, socialism, capitalism, whatever it all is. But you said that earlier, and it's so true that really in a, in a purely communist society, there's not a lot of incentive for anybody to do anything. Right. Um, and as soon as you revert back to individualism and some form of capitalism, then you get some people who are more aggressive and more mm -hmm. ambitious than others. And Sung is a, is a good example of that. Do you see Lu Fei as that kind of person who got derailed? Uh, do you see him coming back to that? Is he going to be happy just sitting in his village? Well, that's a good question. The, the, the way he phrases it is that he's happy to be there because uh, he's a guy who came of age just after the Cultural Revolution, but the Cultural Revolution touched everybody. You know, so his, his parents were sent away uh, as youth were in those days to work in the fields and so on, derailing their education, being sent thousands of miles away from home for 10 years or, or more. Um, his Part of the backstory is that his his grandparents were bourgeois artists or professors, so they were sent to re-education camps, and some of them never came back. And you know, the Chinese Chinese people are still dealing with the aftermath of that. Um, and you know, in the old days, you could never criticize the Cultural Revolution or Mao, but now they're like, well, he did some good things and some bad things. So you know, very slowly. Um, some criticisms are coming out and people are coming to terms with that history. Um, but for Lou, he's a guy who having seen injustice, what he considers injustice firsthand and kind of the heavy hand of the government became a police officer because he wants to protect the ordinary citizen from such you know, bureaucracies. And he feels that the best way to do that is to be a police policeman and decide who is guilty of a crime and who is not, or at least investigate and, and figure that out. Um, 
So when he's remanded to Raven Valley, which is a small town, he has a much closer relationship to the people there and is able to, you know, the crimes are far, a far less uh, degree, um, but he's able to have a more say in what's going on. And uh, he, he claims that he's content uh, away from the corrupt um, issues that he faced on a daily basis in the Harbin Police Department. Whether or not that's, you know, a bit of rationalization or not is hard to say. His story will change. He can't stay there forever. You know, in, the, in this book, he's 38 or 39 years old. And so he's got 20 years of his career ahead of him and something will have to happen. But always, uh, as long as his love interest, Yen Yen, is working at the Red Lotus, his locus will be Raven Valley. Unless they break up or something, I don't know. Well, and they, you know what? You're the only one who will know if that's going to happen. It'll be. I don't even know. <laughs> you don't even know right now. Of course, you have a lot more exploring to do. So we can't talk very much about the actual um, investigation, but you can at least give us the instigating incident. What is the crime that touches off um, the narrative, the, the, the mystery or narrative of the book? So the crime is that a young woman is discovered uh, in her home alone uh, and, sorry, my cat is coming back in. <laughs> um, she's been murdered and some of her internal organs have been removed. Then she's been sewed back up, washed and dressed and makeup put on her face. So she looks, you know, like a, a little doll in some ways and a square of folded paper money, lucky money, death money has been put in her mouth. Um, so that's what touches off the investigation. You know, is it uh, somebody who's um, stealing organs to, to resell? Is it a sex crime of some kind? Um, you know, there's weird ritualistic aspects to it. What what talents would it take? What abilities would it take for somebody to remove those organs, know, knowing where the organs are, and to sew the body back up? You know, that kind of thing. So that that touches off the investigation. Yeah, just a little hint of Jack the Ripper, except not really, because uh, no, but I mean, you know, anytime, anytime a body is violated that way, mm -hmm. um, I think it, it raises hackles, because that's not, you know, like, an ordinary domestic murder. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I mean, most murders are really committed by family members, you know, people or, or people in a circle that, mm -hmm. that know the person. But in this case, that brutality kind of argues that maybe there was no real personal connection mm -hmm. between the victim and whoever, mm -hmm. whoever did the murder. So that's, that's all we can say. But it's an interesting premise on, um, on which to go forward. What do you see? Um, you know, are you working on a second book already? I've written a second book. It's with the, it's, it's with my editor, so well, he's going to get back to me soon. Yeah. Right. Um, and again, with the with Lufe as the protagonist. Yes. So this this book is this book is touched. The second book is touched off by a missing persons case, which leads to the uh, illegal trade in animal parts. In China. Also touches very briefly on, I know people don't want to read too much about this, touches briefly on coronavirus, the coronavirus situation in China um, and how it's hampered the illegal animal trade because post coronavirus, the government has issued a new decree on what can and cannot be farmed for food and so on. But Chinese traditionally have uh, incorporated animal products as part of their medicine, their medicinal remedies, um, and also uh, remedies for virility and so on and so forth. So it's a huge, huge market. And in, in the second book, Lu Fei uh, kind of ends up tracing this down a black hole, which leads him all the way down into Burma or Myanmar, uh, which is where this trade is originating. So it's you know, he goes very far afield for the second book. It's really interesting. I mean, I've, I've hosted two events in the last little while about um, the illegal poaching of Africa of, um, mm -hmm. of animal and animal parts for it. But the huge market of it appears to be Vietnam, or at least the big distribution center is Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Although much of the end result is in fact 
China. And, you know, interestingly enough, I'm a Vietnam War widow, but um, when I was in, uh, in Vietnam, in Hanoi, with a great reluctance, I finally agreed to go to the war museum there. Mm. And I was really surprised to discover that 85% of the space of the war museum in Hanoi is devoted to Vietnam's long struggle with China. And mm -hmm. only a tiny bit is devoted to what they call the American War, mm -hmm. which for them was was just kind of a blip in their ongoing mm -hmm. thousand year struggle. Um, That's correct. Yeah. With China. And um, that was a real surprise to me. You know, yeah. for us, it looms so much larger than mm -hmm. it does for the Vietnamese. Um, and, you know, it's important to remember that they have a contiguous southern border in part, just the way mm -hmm. Russia has a contiguous northern border that's right mm -hmm. um and then you know the whole question of taiwan and you know did chiang kai-shek really escape with you know much of the much of the imperial treasure and is it somewhere mm -hmm. in taiwan or did it all drop into the ocean or it's you know buried under a mountain or there's so many different things that um that one can think about um in in viewing china Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a I'm a huge devotee of the Judge D mysteries written by Robert Van Gulick. I have mm -hmm. read them all, mm -hmm. and um, and when I go to New York to the Metropolitan Museum, I always visit the Chinese wing and sit mm -hmm. in the Chinese Garden, and, <laughs> you know, envision the judge and and you know it. Even though those were written in the Tang Dynasty, which was what like fifth. This fifth or sixth century BC, I think. I mean, AD um, or whatever the Chinese call. Nine, yeah, nine hundreds around the nine hundreds. Was yeah. it that much? Okay, but um, so much of the you know the the bureaucracy, people sitting for exams in order to prevail in the civil service. You know the role of the judge and and how he functioned in the uh, in the judiciary and the civil service, the family structure, uh, mm -hmm. all of those things really um, are surprisingly timeless and then you can go all the way to Xi'an and you know visit the terracotta warriors and mm -hmm. and recognize that that emperor I've always loved that story you probably know it mm -hmm. but um you know he was very powerful and mm -hmm. when he died nobody wanted to acknowledge that at least mm -hmm. his immediate followers so mm -hmm. they put him on ice and they drove him around for <laughs> quite a long time although the the warriors were supposed to protect his tomb, but as I as I remember it, his tomb has still not been opened because mm -hmm. the idea is that it's floating in some sea of mercury or something mm -hmm. very very mm -hmm. toxic. So, if anybody ever ever does figure out or or does in the same way that if they ever find the tomb in Mongolia of which mm -hmm. one is it Kublai Khan? Yeah, I think or, so. Yeah. Or the other yeah. Khan, you know, whatever. Um, Genghis, or, Genghis, yeah. Genghis Khan, right. Or, you know, if you neither neither the tomb of Cleopatra nor Alexander the Great has ever been found in Egypt. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there are these really wonderful archaeological potential mm -hmm. finds out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Just, I do think I do think the consistency of Chinese civilization all the way up to Mao mm -hmm. from from the guy that, you know, was the Terracotta warrior king mm -hmm. was remarkable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what do you think broke it? Was it the war that broke it? Was it um, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria? What is it that caused such an enormous change to China? Um, well, it's interesting because if you look at China up until around the 1600s, it was perhaps you know the most advanced civilization in the world, maybe late 1500s. Uh, they had the compass early. Uh, you know, they had. Uh, various kinds of um, machines and so on, but um, medicine, of course, literature, but, and this is just a guess, you know, in China, there were enough people and land and resources, unlike Japan, for example, that uh, you didn't have to get super creative sometimes in order to survive, in order to grow food and things like that you had enough people that you didn't have to develop really advanced weapons to overcome a disparity with your enemies. You were isolated. Therefore, 
you were not um, interacting with certain cultures and picking up technologies and things like that. And China had an issue with the way the government was run, which is exactly what you said. In those days, you uh, you know you could be born into royalty or so on. But the the, the easiest the, the the main way people became powerful was through the educational system, and that educational system was based on non-scientific um, pursuits, such as the proper way to write uh, a memorial to the emperor, um, how to write a poem, things like that. Beautiful things, but not practical. So you had an entire administration of people who didn't really have practical knowledge on things like irrigation, engineering, political science. You also had a, an emperor who was the ultimate power who was Often, uh, you know, China has a saying about the first first three emperors of every dynasty were great. After that, they were all terrible because they're enclosed in a palace and surrounded by eunuchs who take care of their every need and ministers who are whispering in their ear. And they just, you know, smoke opium and hang out with their concubines or something rather than really try to rule. Um, so yeah, the, the, the government was not efficient. The way it was structured was not efficient and things just slowly fell apart. It was a long downward trajectory uh, leading to a lot of, you know, they had the, uh, for example, the Taiping Rebellion in the 1850s killed millions of people, um, Boxer Rebellion. And then around that time as the, well, I think, I, I think probably the main thing was the Opium War of 1842. I do which too. Is, you know, where, where Hong Kong uh, be, was ceded to British territory, the, the English and other nations, French and so on, wanted goods from China. They wanted porcelain, you know, things like that. And th the thing that they found that they could sell the easy, most easily was opium. And uh, so they were importing opium and forcing the Chinese to buy opium to get money to pay for these other Chinese goods. And the Chinese military was not strong enough to resist these efforts. And uh, so they had to secede territory. Um, they had to secede in the North and uh, in Shanghai and so on and so forth to create these concessions. And um, they just continued this, this downward spiral until they kind of went through their death throes of the imperial system uh, and the emperor was overthrown in 1911. And then they had a period with Chiang Kai-shek and Sun Yat-sen where they tried to create a republic, which was a fertile uh, time for them to think about different political systems and try and create something new, a new society, try to modernize their military. But, you know, China's a big country. It's very spread out. And a lot of these uh, provinces were ruled by warlords who really wanted to just have their own localized power. So it was very difficult for them to unite as a country and, and move forward. Then, of course, the Japanese invaded. So it's just one thing after another, yeah. starting in the 1800s, basically. You know, it's an interesting parallel to Versailles and, you know, what happened after Louis XIV, you know, isolated the court. So Louis XV and XVI were, just as you say, isolated from the country and things kind of fell apart. But I also think it's really hard for a country like Russia or China, um, you know, to, to loosen that. We're probably seeing that in the, you know, the United Arab Republic and so forth today. Mm -hmm. Hope we're not going to see it here in the US, although I think we came perilously close to it mm -hmm. not long ago and we'll see mm -hmm. what the fallout is. Patrick, let's call you up. I don't have any incense, I just have wine. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, Brian, actually, I have a couple questions for you. Um, I read a little bit about your about your uh, about your your history, and tell us a little bit about kung fu, uh, North Shaolin kung fu, to be particular. Do you practice it yourself? I know you've been involved in several books. Hmm. Yes, um, not lately, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, you know, as a kid, I took a couple years of karate because most young boys want to learn martial arts because they think they'll, you know, be superhuman in some manner. But I, I didn't love it. Um, I found it, uh, I found the atmosphere kind of rigid and not, not to be disrespectful to Japanese martial arts because there's a lot of great tradition and great martial artists. It just wasn't for me. Um, 
And then later on in college, I joined a Kung Fu group. It just happened to be the Kung Fu group that was at my undergrad and found a completely different atmosphere. Uh, my teacher, Sifu, that's the Cantonese term, most, you know, most Kung Fu from Asia has been imported through the Southern um, provinces. So a lot of the terminology we use in the US is Cantonese terminology when we're talking about Kung Fu. But anyway, my Sifu was a very famous guy named Lai Hong, famous in, in uh, he's from Hong Kong and uh, was a full contact fighter in the days when there weren't a lot of Kung Fu guys that were going to Thailand and other places and, and engaging in these, you know, these bouts of fisticuffs. He, he tells some stories about Bruce Lee and so on. These guys, they're also catty, but in any case, he was the real deal and he was a good guy. I really, you know, developed, I wouldn't call it a, a father-son relationship, but that is kind of sort of the feeling in a Chinese Kung Fu school, which I really enjoyed. Um, and I developed a good social group. And in the process, of course, I was studying Northern Shaolin. So I studied that for some years with Lai Hong. And um, when I would go to, when I went to Taiwan, for example, I would study whatever was there, you know, uh, with different results. I wouldn't say I was always super gung-ho, but it became something that I just did. Instead of jogging, for example, or going to the gym and lifting weights, I would go, you know, do it to, to the Kung Fu class. And then I really found kind of a home when I moved to New York with a uh, school here, two particular teachers, uh, Matt and Chris, who come out of a federation of a Southern Shaolin Kung Fu school here in New York, found a great group of friends. And that's the one I stuck with for the, for the next 10 or 12 years and eventually did some teaching and so on. But um, Kung Fu is a hard thing to make a living at or even to keep a school together because Kung Fu is hard, you know, and if you want to study Kung Fu for real, you, you're going to get hit in the face and people don't want to get hit in the face. So, you know, it's not, it's not aerobics or something like that. You have to have a certain mentality and it's a, it's, is there you know, a, to some extent, a young man's game. Is there a spiritual component to it or a meditative aspect to it? Like some of the there other is. disciplines? There is. Um, there are some, you know, there's Qigong, which is basically a, a moving meditation, which is breathing and moving, which is to develop, you know, your inner chi, your power or whatever, and your focus. Um, the process of learning Kung Fu teaches you body alignment and breath, because those things are what create the movement of your body and the alignment of your body and the breath with that movement is what creates the power for Kung Fu. Kung Fu is not magic but you can punch really hard with Kung Fu by using your breath and your body in a certain way, things like that. Um, I never really got too much into the meditation aspects and there are different schools of Kung Fu which have more of that and some that have less. Um, but for me, the thing was, you know, uh, it was conflict uh, tra training and resolution because if you, strap on the gloves and stuff and you're going to spar it's scary you know it's scary and when you do it afterwards you feel you you know you get a sense of accomplishment you're like i did that and and what people talk about in martial arts is you can be in a situation where people will start where you might be tempted to to engage in violence if you're afraid but with kung fu the idea is you just let it go. You're not afraid. It's not a big deal. You've got nothing to prove. It's just kind of a mindset that, you, that I develop or that one develops through Kung Fu right. or martial arts in general, I think. There's, a, there's an author. Barbara, did you know that Joe Lansdale is, a, is a, uh, a martial arts master? No, I didn't. He is terrifying. Um, <laughs> there are a couple. Next time he's here, I'll have to show a few things. But it, he was in the back room and he has his own school in Nacogdoches, Texas of all places. Mm -hmm. And he developed his own type, but we asked him to show a few things and um, it is truly terrifying mm -hmm. uh, to just a few moves. And his whole thing is, is get in, get out really quickly. You know, don't let it escalate. Mm -hmm. And he's anyway, um, but tell us a little bit. So you ultimately wrote two books um, with another author, I, I believe, mm -hmm. on this topic, right? 
Well, uh, going back to Lai Hong, he, as I mentioned, he was a guy who was very famous in Asia, but not at all known in the United States. Whereas there are a lot of Kung Fu teachers in the US who got famous writing books and making videotapes, but they weren't as accomplished, weren't, I didn't think they were as good, and they had no authentic combat background. Um, you know, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a meathead, but you know, Kung Fu is a martial art. So it, it is ultimately intended for self-defense so that it should be one aspect of it. If you're just doing forms, that's not exactly what it's all about. And I think people lose the essence of Kung Fu when they don't put it into practice. So Lai Hong was the real deal and I thought he deserved a little more recognition. recognition. So I wrote this first book and it published it with Tuttle um it's still out there somewhere on ebay <laughs> this the second one i wrote um because i had some training brothers who you know had been around a long time and i thought that maybe they could contribute something as well so we just kind of got together and and did a second book um yeah and there we are right and also you published uh, an earlier novel um just a few years ago from midnight inc um yeah. there was a contemporary thriller set out here in yeah. the West. Do you mm -hmm. want to talk about that just for a minute or two? Sure. That book was called Kill Devil Falls. Uh, it's about a US, a female US Marshal who's sent to a remote town in uh, the San Joaquin uh, Mountains. And um, the town has been condemned because it's an old mining town. So it's riddled with mines underneath and it's unstable. The county has decommissioned it, but there's a few odd hangers on that continue to live there for various reasons. She's up there to collect a fugitive. She finds out uh, the fugitive maybe stashed some money up there and people are after it. She's not sure who's on her side and who's not. It all takes place in the space of one evening. And it's it's very, very violent book, um, a real dark kind of a crime thriller. Right, and that was- yeah, Midnight Inc is um, no longer yeah. in business because I don't know that it's possible to get much of their um, much of their list um, available right now. Yeah, I mean, I will say I'm thankful to them for publishing the book, but there was no press whatsoever behind it, and it went out of print about six months before Midnight I mean, folded. So, right. So it's, well, it's it was a small else. press, and you know, small presses have hazardous histories. Yeah, so sure. that's it. Um, before we close, um, for those who are interested in reading about China through the realm of crime fiction, um, I mentioned Robert Van Gulick, a Dutch diplomat who wrote these wonderful books about Judge D, as I mentioned earlier, a Tang Dynasty official. And, they are, and he also had these great line drawings that appear in the books. I think the University of Chicago publish them. I hope they're still in print, but if not, I really recommend you look for them. I mean, they're, um, what we say, ninth century, roughly, the Tang Dynasty, but um, really relevant to China today. Uh, Q Shilong has written a wonderful series set in Shanghai, primarily, and spelled Q-I-U-X-I-O, let me see if I can remember it, X- I-A-O. A-I-A-O, um, L-O-N-G. Um, wonderful, wonderful writer, Chinese by birth, teaches in Missouri, uh, in St. Louis, at a college, and has written very well, I think, about the pitfalls of um, the Chinese bureaucracy, and especially the, the Red Princes and the Communist Party. They're great. An author you may not know, Ian Hamilton, who writes one of my favorite series um, with a Chinese um, basically a, a asset recovery specialist, although she's kind of branched out a bit, called Ava Lee. And there's a large Chinese community in Toronto, Vancouver and Toronto in, in China, in Canada. And um, her, her Chinese father's second wife, they separated and, and the second wife, Ava Lee's mother, lives in Toronto in some luxury. The father comes to visit for a couple of weeks every year. But Ava Lee takes you into all kinds of businesses in China and uh, the financial system. And recently, um, Ian, because she had a mentor called Uncle who um, swam from mainland China to Hong Kong or across the water um, during the Cultural Revolution and became 
um, an important figure in the triads. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of interesting morality in these books, but I really, so uncle is getting his own because he eventually died in the Ava Lee series because he was, but uh, we're getting to see uncle in, you know, when he was younger in kind of previews. And if I think they're fabulous because they really explore things that very few mystery novels do, you know, like the fashion industry and so forth, and which is a huge thing in China and an enormous economic engine. So those are all things that I can recommend. There used to be a British author. Do you remember his name, Patrick, who wrote some really very good books about China? And then, yeah, um, I want to say Christopher West. <laughs> yep, that's it. Exactly. Christopher West. And unfortunately, you probably have to find those as, as ebooks, but um, very good. And then, of course, my very longtime friend and marvelous author, Lisa C., who writes wonderful historical set in China, although she's coming up to the modern, but believe it, she wrote three mysteries, which not everybody realizes. The first was called The Flower Net. And then she went off with Snowflower, The Secret Fan, and has not returned to crime fiction, mm -hmm. even though I nag her about it frequently. Anyway, those are all things that you can read in addition to Brian's excellent book, Thief of Souls. So are there any questions, Patrick, that you might want to ask that I interrupted you from doing? Not really. Um, I don't really have any specific questions here. People are definitely tuning in and watching and enjoying the discussion. Uh, one quick point before we break off. I like what you were talking about with, uh, you know, the protagonist in some ways sort of uh, protecting the people against the machine you know, of, of government or corrupt power. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of, uh, there's a great series in, set in Mexico City by Paco Ignacio Taibo. And um, he writes a very quirky, interesting detective series set there. And the whole notion of, of being a detective in the environment where I think they estimate 75% of all crime originates from within the police department mm -hmm. is kind of an interesting idea. And it's along the same along the same line. So those are, I don't know why. I just thought that would be something to throw on the table. Great what's series. The name, what's the name of one of the books? Um, let's see. The first one was called um, Cosa Facil, uh, An Easy Thing. And they were published here for a minute in the late 80s, 90s. They were. And, and then Poison Pen Press actually published a couple of them before he disappeared. They're really yeah no no there's books. some over in the poison pen yeah yeah one of the best titles ever which is uh, no happy ending that's one of his <laughs> that's one of his titles indeed but i is. think you i think you might like them if they're in that, that that tradition very good and that's about it wow. um yeah thank you so barbara's, much barbara's frozen on us right well, it's been wonderful talking to you, Brian. A real pleasure to meet you. I hope you so that much. you will come back and visit us with your second book. Love to. Thank, and, you. Thank um, you. This is, you can tell from this, when people, publicists ask me for a run of show, I laugh uh, <laughs> because, because there really isn't one. You know, we make it up as we go along. And part of the reason is, for those of you watching, there's only a little we can discuss about the actual mystery in the book without ruining it. So we wind up sort of wandering all over the place, um, but I think I think that's a lot of fun. I hope you enjoy it too. Thanks for watching. Um, don't forget, Thief of Souls is the actual book. Uh, we have copies of the Poison Pen, and um, tell your friends um, to catch the podcast. It should be available tomorrow. Watch the video, buy the book. So, night, Brian. Thanks very Thank much you. for your time. Thank Thanks, you so Brian. much. Bye bye. Thank you.